Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our fifth uh, James Bible study. Um, we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and it really is amazing how applicable James is uh, to our current world, uh, not just with the craziness that is happening now, but just in general. Um, so I'm going to start us off with prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that we can come together, even if it is uh, through digital means, that we could be community uh, even when we're not in person. It is a blessing. I ask that your spirit uh, enter into our hearts today, that you, Holy Spirit, open us to your word, that you interpret it, and that you make it alive within us. Amen. So I'm going to start us off by reading verses 1 through 12 of chapter 12, uh, 2. My brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must now, sorry, we're just going to start that over. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritisms. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who have exploited you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture— Love your neighbor as yourself. You are, uh, you are doing right. But if you show favoritisms, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as th those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we're talking about uh, showing favoritisms to the rich uh, at the... Um, at the uh, expense of the poor. Uh, I'd like to say this was a, a, an issue that only James dealt with and that it was um, uh, settled by the time uh, he finished his ministry. Uh, but this has been happening from the day the church started all the way until today. Um, some of the big points in me uh, jump out as we see it in James. And then uh, the minute that the Roman Empire took over Christianity in the 300s, it almost became law. The rich and the powerful held the positions in the church. They were the ones who became the priests, the popes. Um, they controlled everything. And if you were rich, you were, you were fine. If you were poor, you were not going to be able to read the scriptures because they were only in Latin and you couldn't read. Um, that continued on for years and years and years. Uh, I even think of the indulgence issue, which is when um, uh, the church would sell these indulgences to, to the rich who could go out and live any way they wanted to. And the indulgence basically said that, uh, that they were buying grace and buying for forgiveness so they didn't have to change the way they lived. Um, it would be great to say that that ended at the time of the Reformation, uh, that, that the poor wound up being equal with the rich, but that's still not true. Um, one of the churches where I worked as a youth director before going to seminary, 
the minister knew who the rich people were in the church. And he did anything they asked. And that way, when he needed some extra funds, he could pick up the call, the phone and call them, and he got whatever he wanted to. Um, but he had a relationship with them that was vastly different than the relationship he had with the people who couldn't do that. Uh, I also think of there's a youth, um, a nationwide youth program that their whole model of ministry is to go into the schools, go to the people who are attractive, who are popular, and who are rich, get those kids to buy into their program, so that way all the others would follow. It happens, and there are reasons for it. It would be great. It's always nice when you have rich people in your church because you never have to worry about money if they're willing to give it. Now, there are also churches I, who I know that are filled with rich people, and they still have to worry about their budget because the rich people don't give. Um, so the rich and the poor, to this day, is still a major issue when it comes to how we treat people in the church. So with that, let's start in verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believer, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, um, James is really good at bringing himself into the people. He is actually speaking against uh, patriarchy, uh, the power of those who have and those who have not. And so he specifically uses brothers and sisters to make sure people know he's putting himself right there in the midst of them. He also talks about the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when James was writing, we don't have any documentation that people were really believing that Jesus was God. Uh, people believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that Jesus was the Messiah, but not always that Jesus was equal to or a part of God. This is one of the earliest places where we're seeing it, um, that, that really James is talking in words about Jesus that you would only use for God. Um, and so that's kind of a really, really neat part of James. He really is one of the earliest voices to start claiming that Jesus is God. That verse ends by saying uh, that the brothers and sisters, believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritisms. Um, it's a good rule. We should not let one person over another. Uh, all people in the eyes of God are equal. Verse 2. Suppose a man comes into a meeting wearing a gold ring and five fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. So picture, if you will, Hope Presbyterian Church, where we're actually having Sunday service, and two people walk in separate, but at the same time. One of them's dressed in a nice suit and tie, has a good watch on, looks, looks good. Another person comes in and you're pretty sure they're homeless. They're not wearing, they're wearing more rags than they are clothes. Uh, they smell uh, of unwash. The two walk in together. If we're being honest, would we go, but would we greet both equally? I hope we would. That's my hope. But when we put ourselves in this setting, I think it brings in even more meaning because this happens. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, or maybe, sir, you look like a wonderful human being. Come sit by me. We'll bring you into our community. But say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. You know, I don't think any of us would try to encourage a person to sit at our feet. Um, you know, I try to get my kids to do that, and they start kicking me. Uh, so I don't think that would go well. But the difference would be, what if and while we were welcoming the nicely dressed person to come sit with us, if we just didn't invite the person wearing rags and who smelled to sit anywhere, that they would find their own seat and we would leave them at that point. Verse 4, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
this is where it starts to hit home. The minute we start looking at somebody on how they're dressed, uh, how they present themselves, and we treat them better than we treat others, uh, we are discriminating amongst ourselves. Uh, and it doesn't have to just be rich or poor. That's what James is talking about. James is talking about rich and poor because that was what was going on in his community. But what if we start talking also about race? Uh, if the person who's white, we welcome in, where the person who is uh, a minority, uh, we don't take, kick them out. We don't, you know, dis, you know, we don't do anything bad, but we also don't welcome them. Or a person who's gay versus person who's straight. If we have a young couple, uh, a man and a woman couple who come in and uh, we're going to swarm on them like uh, uh, flies to a, sh or bees to a sugary drink at a picnic. Where if a young uh, couple who was gay came in, what would our response be? Would we welcome them in? Uh, would we encourage them to be a part of our community or would we discriminate against them and become the evil judges that James is talking about? It all goes back to that, that we should not show favoritisms. Verse five, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? This is taken directly from the Gospel of Luke. Um, one of my favorite texts in the whole scriptures, and you, you may have already heard this because I preached a few Sundays on it um, uh, a couple months ago, uh, but is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we a lot of times forget that Luke has the Sermon on the Plains, and he has his own version of the Beatitudes. Uh, Luke's version of the Beatitudes differ from Matthew's. Matthew's is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke doesn't care as much about the spirituality of the person. He cares about their physical um, setting. So he says, blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. This tells us a lot about James. James knew the teachings of Jesus. Uh, if we believe that it was written in the 50s or 60s, as opposed to a little later on, he probably hadn't read the Gospel of Luke, because Luke was probably written about the same time or a little later. Um, so he had to have heard Jesus' teaching, which also gives credence to Luke that they are complementing each other. Um, but he is definitely not talking about... Um, uh, he is definitely not talking about uh, your faith. He is not talking about your spiritual well-being. He is talking about those who are poor. Um, now, he does bring in faith because there was a true belief back in that time, both in the Jewish tradition and in the early church, that if you didn't have a lot of possessions, you would probably have a lot of faith. Uh, and there's really some truth to that. Um, when you have much, you don't have to trust in God. Uh, you can trust in your bank account. You can trust in your retirement savings. You can trust uh, in your well-stocked pantry. Uh, you can take trust that your 50 rolls of toilet paper will last you for years to come. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. And we wind up not putting our faith in God nearly as much. Where the people who do not have, the people who don't know where they're getting their next meal from, the people where, who aren't sure if they're going to have a roof over their heads, um, they can't rely on physical wealth or physical possessions. They have to rely on God. And when we rely on God, our faith grows. Uh, James always tries to point out that just because you're poor doesn't mean you have strong faith, um, but it does wind up encouraging it. 
Uh, he continues, though, when he says, uh, to, to the rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom. He promised those who loved, love him. Um, the poor who love God will inherit the kingdom. It is promised. Uh, does that mean in the next world? Does it mean in this world? That's where it gets a little tricky. Um, are they earning points for the afterlife? I've never been a big fan of that. Uh, it's just not um, uh, where the reason why I try to live the way I live. Um, but a lot of people, that's really important for them, that they, that they feel like they need to be able to get, um, uh, get rewarded when the time comes. Um, but it also could be that they are inheriting the kingdom now. Uh, when we're in heaven, we're going to know we're in heaven. Uh, when we are in the full glory of God, where we're finally seeing God in all of God's fullness, we're going to know we're in heaven. Uh, the difference is, um, for those uh, who are on earth, when they get to experience the kingdom today, means that they are able to see God today. So when we have our faith in God, when we put our trust in God, um, it gives us the opportunity to see the true kingdom of heaven now. Is that what James meant? I don't know. Uh, I, you can really make arguments either way. But maybe it's a little different way to look at it. Verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not? So right there, he's saying this is not a... Uh, a hypothetical situation where he's trying to encourage people, you know, if something that may happen, he's calling them out. Uh, he's saying, today, you are dishonoring the poor. You are not treating them the way you're supposed to, and that's part of the reason why I'm writing right now. He continues, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? We now start to get into a conversation. Is he talking about people who are rich, who are Christian, or just the rich in general? And there are, are probably there are really good arguments for both. Um, let's just be honest. Overall, I mean, I, many times the rich exploit the poor. I'm thinking about the one percenters out there right now. Uh, who's uh, the most wealthy people in the world are the first ones to fire their employees during this time of hardship rather than hurt their bottom line. Uh, they don't care that they have $30 billion in the bank. They want to make sure they keep that. rather, than, And they don't really care that their employees are could become homeless or have no income. But this happens both in the church and outside of it. Uh, it could also be very much him talk going back to this idea that the, the rich are giving preferential treatment in church, that they're giving the better seats, that they're putting being put in the leadership positions, um, whereas the people who are poor are taken away from any power. They are there. Uh, we don't even want to look at them, much less put them in places where they can be honored. Uh, in, the, in the time of James, a lot of the a lot of the times that people were uh, the poor were exploited. It wasn't even that it was active; it was that they weren't seen. You would rock, walk right past them without even contemplating that there was a person there. And the same is true today. Um, if you know more times than not, when we go past someone who is homeless or who is begging, we do our best to pretend they're not there. Um, so that is a lot of that ex exploiting. Um, uh, he continues to say, and they, uh, are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Um, there's two ways we can look at this. If you, uh, a lot of people say that this is where we're seeing persecution, that uh, the rich are the ones telling, uh, throwing the Christians in jail uh, because they're Christian. But I don't think that's probably accurate. I think that probably the better way to read this are the poor tend to owe money to the rich. Uh, and if they can't pay, the they would be dragged into court. That's what would happen at that time. Uh, 
And you could either go to jail until your money was paid off. Uh, you could be sold into slavery until your debt was paid off. This is what the court was doing. And I think this is probably closer uh, to what James is talking about rather than the true persecution, which probably came just a little after him. Uh, verse 7. Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who, to whom you belong? So this is another one of those uh, lines that people are trying to say, who is he talking about? Is he talking about the people without faith? Because if he's talking about rich people who aren't Christian, then the blaspheming could be the persecution. Uh, it could be, uh, um, you know, mocking, or it could be saying you're just a poor Christian, you have no rights or anything like that. Uh, but another way to look at it, and I think probably that's more applicable if we're going to try to read some meaning behind it, is if there are people within the church suing people who are also in the church, uh, the rich Christians are suing the poor Christians or bringing them into court, is that not blaspheming the name of God? Uh, there is no love there. It is all about money. Or if the person who is exploiting the poor is a Christian, is that not is that exploitation not blaspheming the name of the Lord? I would say yes. I think that is probably the way we blaspheme more than any other, is by uh, saying we love people, and then talking about hate or talking about how or or by exploiting or or um, uh, hurting the other people, who especially those who have faith. Uh, although I would say everybody, but that's just me. Uh, verse 8. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, you won't have to be a, around me very long to realize that that's probably the Scripture I quote the most uh, is, as our job of being a follower of Christ. I love how he calls it the royal law. Um, we tend to call it the golden rule or something like that. Um, but I like that. The royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you are doing right. So when you actually put that into practice, you are doing what you're supposed to do. You are living out the life that Christ embodied for us. Um, it's interesting. He doesn't bring in the second, the first part of that, which is love your God. He's only bringing in the part about loving your neighbor as yourself. So he doesn't want us to think about our relationship with God here. He wants us to think about how we're interacting with our brothers and sisters in this world. Um, and if you're going to use Jesus's explanation of love your neighbor as yourself, then we also have to bring in the Samaritan the Good Samaritan, which means that we're supposed to treat people who have different faith as if they are our neighbor as well. And when we do that, we are living the life God wants. Verse 9, But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. So the opposite of loving your neighbor as yourself is by showing favoritisms to other people. Now, this is another one that's pretty harsh. Uh, I would have never, ever put those two together. And that now that I see them there, it makes a lot of sense. When you are putting the rich first, if you are putting the powerful first, if you are putting the attractive first or the popular first, or the people whose lifestyle that is easier for us to take first, we are not loving the others as if they are ourselves. He says, then we are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Um, verse 10, he starts, he kind of teaches it to him. Our, uh, he he uh, illustrates what he means by that here in the next couple of verses. So I'm just going to continue on on that. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it, breaking all of it. Um, so I have a uh, confession to make. Um, uh, about a year ago, I got a speeding ticket. Uh, that means I am a lawbreaker. It means that the entire law I am guilty of. Maybe not. He's not talking about 
the civil law. He is talking about the law of Moses. He is talking about the fact that we uh, that the that the Old Testament gives rules and regulations on what it means to be a follower of of the God of the Old Testament, our God. And if you fail in just one of those, you have broken the whole law. It's why we tend to say, if you have sinned once, you are guilty of death. That's harsh. But when you break one law, you are a lawbreaker. He shows that a little bit more clarity in verse 11. Again, it's probably not a speeding ticket um, that he's referring to, but some a little bit deeper. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Um, so the author I was reading with says he probably picked these two on purpose. These are two where you put yourself first and you demean other people. If you commit murder, you're saying what you want is more important than another person's life. That it would be better to, uh, for them to die so you can have more. Adultery is saying that you want your um, pleasure to, is more important than all the other people's whose lives that will affect, like your spouse or your children. Um, you are truly putting yourself above your neighbors in both of these situations. And so when you break one of them, you are truly breaking the law of Christ you, and of, of the Old Testament and the royal law. Uh, what is really hard, though, is when we start reading that through Jesus' lens from the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, if you have anger, you have committed murder. Or if you've looked at another person in lust, you have committed adultery. Uh, to this day, I have not murdered anyone, and I have not committed adultery. Uh, but I'm not going to say I've never looked at somebody with lust, or I've never been angry enough with someone that it probably broke the law, um, which means we're all lawbreakers. Uh, at least I am. So this is where things get tricky. This is where we start needing the law we talked about last time, uh, the perfect law of freedom. And James starts talking about that. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. When we realize that we probably are all lawbreakers, we need to speak and act as those who are going to be judged. When I go before the throne of God, if it works out this way, and I have to account for every sin I have ever done, uh, and especially those sins I haven't asked for forgiveness for. I'm in a lot of trouble. I sin every day with stuff that I don't ask for forgiveness for. Um, every day. Uh, so if I'm going to be judged on those, I'm going to be found guilty. So when I treat people, I need to treat people as if I'm going to be found guilty. Uh, my initial thought is as we're approaching Easter or Good Friday in the next few weeks is the, the prisoners who were on the cross with Jesus. The one prisoner threw insults at Jesus where the other one who realized that he also had been condemned spoke of compassion and said he is innocent while we're guilty. Well, we can be up there on the cross saying we're guilty. So let's treat each other with kindness during our time. Verse 13 confirms that. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Um, if we realize that we do show favoritism, if we realize we are lawbreakers, that we haven't loved our neighbors as ourselves, um, and we don't give compassion, 
we will not be shown mercy. Now, again, there's two ways of reading this. There's the one that says, you won't be shown mercy as we are standing before God in the courts of heaven if we're going to go to heaven or hell. Uh, many times people use it that way, that you will burn in hell if you haven't treated people with mercy. Um, but there's another way to look at it, and that is, again, in this world. Uh, the, when we don't treat people with mercy, people tend to not treat us with mercy. Um, if we're mean to other people, people aren't going to be nice to us. Um, there's an old Bob Dylan song uh, that talks about uh, a, a person who looked down her nose at Dylan and then when uh, she fell and Dylan rose, he wasn't going to show her much kindness either. Although it would be nice if we were all gracious enough to show mercy, even when someone hadn't treated us mer merciful, it's hard to do that. When someone has treated us with kindness, love, and mercy, it's much easier to treat others with kindness, love, and mercy. The end of this section is a line that I am in love with. I think it is outstanding. It says, mercy triumphs over judgment. This is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the most merciful who has ever lived. Jesus is the sign that God is merciful to us. And there is no judgment that can counteract that. There is nothing that is as powerful as that. Uh, when we show mercy, it, it trumps judgment. Uh, when we are showing mercy to the poor who walk into our doors or to those who um, who we have judged, that is so much more powerful um, than if we judge them. And one, we're inviting them into our family. We're inviting them into a place where they can be welcomed as full members, where they are loved and appreciated. On the other, they are treated just the way they normally are, as an outcast, as someone who doesn't belong. Mercy is always more powerful than judgment. Uh, next time, we're going to start looking at verse 14 and may actually get through the chapter to verse 25. We'll have to see about that. Uh, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you're enjoying our Bible studies, let me know. Um, and again, always make comments or questions. Uh, I love getting questions and comments, and uh, I've only had one so far. I'd love some more. Um, well, let's pray. Our Lord and our God. Thank you for showing mercy on us even when we don't deserve it. Thank you for loving us when we haven't always loved our neighbor as ourselves. Thank you for treating us better than we treat the poor. Open our eyes, Lord, to the people who we show favoritism to and those who we show favoritism against. Let your love be our love to those who have been neglected, who have been, um, uh, who have been exploited, uh, those who have been put down. Help us to show your love and acceptance to all. Amen.